had spoken today. Uh, the second is to, to field questions that, that, that might be better addressed to a group of us rather than individuals um, after any given talk. Um, but then, but then kind of, in, I think in some ways more importantly, um, uh, <laughs> like Conrad and I wanted the, the workshop not to be entirely sort of theoretical. So, so we want to encourage questions that come from your own research interests and your own research projects now. And if you have kind of like, you know, sort of things to offer uh, or, or questions to ask, that, that will help you in your kind of specific research projects. Like these roundtables um, might be a good time for, for that kind of thing. I'm not suggesting that we'll do this in, that, in the sequence as I've described it, right? So they can all kind of like mix together, sort of a little bit. So, right, so, so on, on, right, so we divided the room into sort of those of us who spoke today and then uh, those of you who have not spoken today. Um, so, so like I'm going to ask the first question, but then after that, Right. If you have any questions that are best asked for, like to, to multiple ones of us to encourage interaction, that would be very welcome. And then, as I say, also questions that come from and comments that come from your own current research projects, we'll be really interested to hear about them uh, and to think through them with you as well. Um, so the first question I thought we will start with is this sort of question of like, what happens when our research methods don't produce the same results? Right, so like it's all well and good to talk about triangulation, and I mean it's the same that Will isn't here right now, but like because that in some ways it's the most acute for the talk that he gave, which is what happens when you know vignette measures and self-report measures and implicit measures just don't agree with one another. Like what what are we meant to do in that kind of situation? Um, because then then you you have the attempt to triangulate evidence, but then also a failure to do so, and then suddenly you have a decision to make about what. Like how to think, what to believe, you know, how to proceed from there. Do you, do you guys have thoughts about about what happens when triangulation fails in that kind of way? I think like the answer to that question differs pretty dramatically based on what you're trying to measure. Mm -hmm. So, um, like I think there are just things. Well, I mean, I'll just throw out there that I would never put an IAT in one of my experiments because I'm pretty <laughs> sure like you're not going to get anything you think you are out of that. Um, I have been long convinced of that. But like I think, I mean, I, I usually try to measure things in a couple different ways. So like I, you know, I said this, I always try to put qualitative open-ended questions in with questionnaire data and that kind of thing. And then, um, and then like it gives you some context to interpret things when they go wrong, which is, is nice. And I mean, sometimes you just don't know, you just kind of have to say, this is what we did, this is what we got, I don't know. <laughs> but like, I think like, like having, like there's, it's underappreciated method to just let people tell you what they think about what you're doing. So I'll, I'll give an example from a graduate student that I'm working with, and this is not related to um, religion at all. She studies immigration um, in the UK. And so she added comment boxes to a survey that she did that was all questionnaires. And people could just comment on the questionnaires at the end. And she had, so there was a, the, you know, it's a standard measure of acculturation. It's like the four types of yeah. acculturation. And, you know, it's, there's problems with it, I think, based on all sorts of things. But one thing that I never considered and that she found is that she had about 50% of her people mm. who did it say, this is, I hate this. This is not. This is a stupid measure. Why am I answering these questions? Like I answered these questions, but I don't know what they're about, and I don't think they're getting. And like, like if you're, like people were, like participants in the survey were like actually kind of upset by this, and like we would just never know that information if you hadn't. So I, I think like you know one of the ways to kind of deal with these things is to just let people actually tell you what they think about what you're doing. Participants yeah. to tell you. Um. Yeah, that's true. It's uh, it it. Sometimes you get the opposite counterintuitive results. So I, I, like I once ran, ran a study uh, where um, we, we asked what we thought was a very stupid, uh, ourse researchers ourselves, we thought it was a very stupid question. Not only stupid, but also offensive. Uh, so the, I think we phrased the question as like, yeah, uh, so it's a sample full of non-religious people. So I think the question was something like, well, given that you don't believe in God, so, like, so like what then do you believe in? And, and it was intentionally a dumb question. Uh, and intentionally, in some ways, uh, kind of aggressive and, and offensive question. And then we allow people to comment. And we were expecting that a whole bunch of people would say, like, this is obviously a fucking stupid thing to ask us. And, but, and, and almost 0% of people did so, right? And, we just, like, and that, that, that itself sort of we found surprising, that, that non-religious people found the question entirely meaningful thing to ask, even though 
like as research as researchers, we thought, well, like this is a dumb question. Like, you know, surely most people find it totally meaningless, and yet they didn't. So, so right. So sometimes the, the comment boxes allow you to figure out when your questions are dumb, but sometimes the comment boxes allow you to figure out that actually your questions are not dumb, even though they really look dumb. Yeah. Um, so there, there is that. Well, I mean, this this led to a follow-up study where we just like asked people like, what about your culture is important for you to maintain your cultural identity, and what do you want to change? And it turns out that the things people want to keep are food and clothing. And the things I want to change are like values, right? yeah, so, which, like, which is yeah. you know fits with most people's I think lived experience, but it's very much not what the acculturation literature says. Yeah, right? yeah, like, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to keep laksa and, and reject you know patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, literally. Surprise, that. surprise. Turns out if you ask a whole bunch of people that question, they also just say That's that. Right. <laughs> Actually, when I come up, come to think about Polish uh, culture, I'm going Polish food. Uh, yeah. I'm not so keen on that. Uh, well, <laughs> that's because your food sucks. Right? <laughs> yeah, so well, interestingly, that. one of the samples that we did this in was Polish immigrants in the UK, and they also claim food very highly. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> not for nothing, though. <laughs> <Polish food. laughs> they would compare it with, with this with British cuisine. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's point. true. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. It's a good explanation. Um. To answer your question, John, I think when that opportunity, I call it an opportunity, because sometimes when you're not expecting something, it's an opportunity to be like, oh, you know, is there something different about my study or the population? And is it an opportunity then to do a follow-up to figure out, oh, maybe this is a really cool thing. Sometimes, though, so one thing that I've learned is actually to do videos and audio so that you can return to it, because maybe it's something about the experimenter, or there's an artifact in the study, or there's something weird about the design, or there's something that the kids are doing. So it's good to go back and just make sure there's not something a little yeah. bit strange about it. Um, and if there's not, um, or even if there is, it's a chance to do perhaps follow up a few more studies to control for right. something. Um, it's also an opportunity to say, okay, actually it was a bad design. I don't think we can do a follow up. Let's scrap it. Yeah. That's happened a few times with me where it's like, oh, I think we've missed an opportunity there. It was poorly designed or whatever. I don't think we can actually salvage it. I think it's just time to put it away. Yeah. But other times, it, it is an opportunity to realize, oh, okay, this is something we totally didn't expect. Yeah. Um, let's do something else. Um, Pre-registration is also something that's really helpful. So when you get yeah. something you don't, you can at least, okay, this is unexpected. We did control for these things. It was pre-registered. Um, and then you know try and publish it that yeah. way. Um, but yeah. yeah, but for the most part, I think of it that's an opportunity. I think that's probably right, right? Because like in the, in the developmental context in particular, you have these classic findings where, like, I mean, you might know about this, where like the infants will, will gaze in one direction, but then they reach for another, right? And then you have this like, wait a second, what's going on, right? And and, and it turns them, you know, and one and one one possibility is that something very interesting is going on, right? That that the that the two behaviors, the eye gaze and the reaching, represent like different cognitive states and or inclinations, and that's interesting. Like I think. The, the, the tendency, you know, like given Will's talk, for example, in social psychology among adults, I think it's very often, well, one of these responses is true, and the other one is bogus and bad, right? So, so we should trust one and not the other, reject one and keep the other. But like, I, I, don't, I don't know if that's always a reasonable way to proceed, right? Like maybe both things are, are going on at the same time. I mean, like Martin, like, do you, like does, does Dimitri have a view? I, I, I think he used to have a view about what's going on with like, the, the difference between self-report and heart rate data with yeah. like firewalking, for example. I mean, is his view that there are two different things going on simultaneously, or that one of them is bogus? So, um, so thank you for this question. I wanted to no, no, this in front of you, so we have oh, work? the microphone. Good, good. <laughs> And then obviously, this question is going to be super important for physiological measures, right? So it was part of my talk tomorrow. So it seems like there, there has been a lot of issues already discussed today. So my talk will be fortunately quite short tomorrow. But anyways, to get at get at your question, uh, yeah, it's it. Maybe I'm not going to talk on Dimitris's behalf because actually I'm not sure. I mean, he's pretty skeptical about self-report. So I think he may be more on the side that you know. Like that's his motivation to abandon self-reports. Uh, I'm not that radical, and I'm more on the side of like the, those differences are actually interesting. However, we need to first make sure we understand the data generation process for all the levels that we are measuring, because you know. So so let's say we are thinking about measuring some beliefs and you know some physiological reactions that we expect the belief should cause. 
Yeah. Or in my case, I measure self-reported anxiety and then you know, I measure a galvanic skin response as a physiological manifestation of anxiety. And often there are contradictions. But in, in terms of anxiety, I may think, okay, the, sometimes the uh, uh, data generation process on the self-report is actually biased, you know, and I can see that there are mostly males, that happens with, with men, that they just report no anxiety whatsoever. <laughs> but I do see on the physiological uh -huh. measure. So, I mean, I can assume, I don't know, but I assume that there is a bias in the data, right? right? And it can go other way for the physiological measures, you know, there may be... Uh, 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 there may be just noise in the measure that is introduced by some other factors. So, so th th I think that's the first step that we need to make sure that you know we are actually measuring. It's actually all the levels of measurements are valid, and if they are, and there is still discrepancy, then that's the interesting question. And and I hope that you know this question leads us to actually reform reformulate how the system works. So perhaps th this you know physiological process that we think is associated or is involved in producing some kind of response or behavior is not involved there, you know, and then, then it should lead to follow-up studies. And so that's, that's the best uh, answer I can get at how to resolve this. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, from my, my experience, it happens very often. Like, I, it's very rare that I get really nice correspondence between self-reports and, and physiology. Okay, okay, I didn't realize that, that's interesting. Did the rest of you have some questions for one another before we... Well, yeah, I mean, I wanted to raise something. I've been spending a lot of time with quantitative sociologists, right? Um, quantitative sociologists are pretty big on representative samples, right? And that usually requires, first of all, a relatively large sample, and especially constructed sample. And that's just not something that happens in psychology very often. And there's a second issue also, because a lot of the methods we've been talking about are really quite intensive. So you can't get large samples unless you have enormous resources, right? So to a certain degree, there seems to be, a, you know, a choice between what kind of method you use and how large a sample you, you can have, and then also the question of, well, should we be looking at um, quantitative, sorry, we should be looking at representative samples, right? Something that psychologists don't generally think about. So I just wanted to bring that question in onto the table because we've had essentially a group of psychologists speaking today. So sure. what's your thinking on that? I mean, I think actually representative samples are becoming more and more common in psychology, so I've used them, I know, a lot of, anyone, any of my colleagues and any project that we're doing where we're collecting large-scale survey data specifically, we would use a representative sample. Um, the times where we don't do that, so I think like the study we did in Singapore, we were trying to target different religious groups, and so, I mean, so you just, there's only so many things you can target, and if you want to get like a sizable group of like traditional Chinese uh, believers, then you can't necessarily also target representativeness across Singapore sure. because there's not actually that many of them. <laughs> it becomes really difficult. Um, but I think it's not. It's it's definitely increasingly common to use them, and I think when people people are aware of some of the psychometric problems with you know, just using student samples and all that stuff, which is becoming more and more common within psychology than representative samples are where people go. I, I think, so, so I think that like, psychologists, um, I'm gonna put sociologists and political scientists in the same group, with, my, with apologies to David. Um, <laughs> uh, like, I, like, I think we mean different things by the term representative sample, right? I think, I think we mean different things partly because we're interested in different kinds of questions. So, so take the kind of like or paradigmatic case of political science study. What you want to know is how many people are going to vote for the Democrat and how many people are gonna vote for the Republican. And if you want to know that, then you better as hell have a representative sample, yes. right? Because you're looking, you, you want you want your sample to be able to to be extrapolated and predict like an outcome, and 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 like it's very obvious that depending on which bit of society you look at, 
they will like enormously bias your the data that you collect, which will then lead to like inaccurate predictions about about the election, right? So so the, in the paradigmatic case in political science, it's very very important that the sample is represented in in a particular way. Social so, socioeconomic status is an obvious one. Re representation across all fifty American states or whatever, right? Like mm -hmm. and like age right age is a great predictor of political affiliation in America. So so like so you have these like vectors. Of, of things that predict voting behavior and like you want to capture that because what you want is it basically you're doing opinion polling sure. right and, but so psychology is roughly like in general I'm not interested in opinion polling mm -hmm. like I think sometimes we are so so sometimes in, in like developmental studies sometimes we're interested in like what proportion of kids say that like cameras have souls or whatever right and, like, and, and in that in those situations you, we might we, we might care more about the the, the, representat the representativeness because there we're looking at a percentage right like we're looking at basically the same sorts of things structurally that political scientists are looking at which is just proportion of people say yes versus no but for the most part what psychology is interested in are like correlations between variables or experimental effects right and i think at that point and maybe this is just a failure of imagination on our part like i think we begin to find it dif more difficult to imagine that that you know that demographic differences make a big difference at the correlational level no, so so. And, 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 like, I have your imagination. Like I do think we are wrong. Like, you know, I think there, there's increasing evidence that we are wrong about this, right? I like, mean, this just seems to me how we ended up with the weirdest, weirdest people in the world problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, what's wrong with just studying right. students at Harvard? I feel like. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if I can actually defend John here. I, I think that's not actually what. Oh, what you were saying, and I was going to come on to this tomorrow when we talk about quantitative sociology and Strangely measures. Strangely enough. Yes. Um, so it's absolutely the case, I think, that uh, psychologists happily are moving away from just student samples. You know, that was clearly um, not helpful and it is good to have a wide cross-section, but I think John would agree with that. What John is saying is that it's not absolutely critical to necessarily have all of the proper weightings because the key question is not about the prevalence of some particular characteristic, it's about the associations and individual differences. And I think that's a perfectly legitimate aim for psychologists to have. Yeah, so uh, getting back to like what, what, I, what, I, what I said at the beginning, which is that I think we mean different things by representativeness. I think the important thing for, for people like us is that you know if we're interested in, for example, the relationship between like theistic beliefs and moral beliefs, that like then we better be collecting data from different religious traditions, right? So like so, so whereas like socioeconomic status or education might be like less obviously important in that situation, religious and ethnic tradition might be concomitantly much more saliently important, right? So so I think we do care about slightly different things in terms of representativeness. Um, and and, and like, but I do think that we are moving in the kind of right direction in, in that sense. We, we might not be waiting for age or whatever, but I think we are more and more now collecting data from like not just like Protestants in the northeast of America. Yeah, but I do think like it's it's a so I, I would never I don't wait my data sets even when I collect representative samples because for lots of reasons. But um, I do like one thing I think that people often miss is that like the kind of sociological variables that we don't necessarily always think about are often really important, like yep. SES or like where you went to school or your neighborhood or all of these other variables can have huge impacts. Um, and I think a lot of, you, you see this with some of the stuff on like heritability indices and stuff like that, where when you measure heritability, like how heritable IQ is in, in you know, the kind of standard psychological samples, it comes up highly heritable, and if you measure it in really low SES samples, right. it turns out it's not at all heritable because right. it's the environment very variable, right? So like, <laughs> you know, you, you, you get these things where all of a sudden it turns out that not looking at a demographically diverse sample was a big problem. And I think we uh, oftentimes, the assumption that that's not true isn't tested. And yeah. that's that's problematic. And yeah. I, I mean, this is the same with like cross-cultural research, right? People say, well, this is not cross-culturally variable. It's like, you don't actually know that. <laughs> like, you yeah. just, like, <laughs> Yeah, I think the old assumption that all human minds are the same and therefore studying North American Protestants is fine. Like, like I, I, that must be quite uncommon now, I think, even among mm -hmm. psychologists. You reckon? I mean, I think you still, you still get pushback quite a bit. I, like, we still get pushback on stuff and, and the, you know, there are, I mean, yes, it's definitely more 
the case. And I mean, you get the kind of the middling sort of, I guess this is like belief affecting behavior to bring it full circle where like the weird people paper largely just gets cited as like future directions in papers. Like I would say uh, probably three of the, you know, 5,000 citations are people going like, you know, then this was a weird sample in future directions to try to study people who are not like white Christian college students. <laughs> like, but like, I, so, you know, everyone kind of like either, so there, there are people who still deny it, but I think there's a much larger, this is, I'll channel Will on this. Will would say that the weird people are the most cited, lowest impact paper right. <laughs> like in psychology <laughs> because it hasn't actually done that much to change what people do. Yeah. So everyone's aware of the problem and then still not doing different stuff. And I can just say, this is one of the reasons why I love so much the project you have doing retrospective uh, studies in Mauritius. Because uh, yeah. that's a very different religious uh, background, and I'm really keen on seeing what the results are going to be there. Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> so we have a project, it's part of the Explaining Atheism project that's being run by um, a postdoc, uh, Nishida Rosen and Ishii yes. there. Yeah. So it's, it's looking at survey data and then doing kind of these retrospective life histories in a place that's rapidly changing. So Mauritius is, you know, it's. Um, your grandparents, if you live in Mauritius, your grandparents probably were agricultural, maybe sugar cane fields, and like the the kids are now like on TikTok and fully educated in university. <laughs> so like, there's this rapid change. So looking at how how that process across different peoples. But anyway, it's it's a cool setup because there's yeah. lots of different religious groups, and you know, there's you know we're going to study atheism, the process of atheism, in like Hindu and Muslim and, yep. and Christian samples. Yep. If I can just add to something, I think the main problem is uh, not that we should all be studying representative samples, but that we don't know which uh, variables will be important. Like when I was when I started studying uh, how toxoplasmosis affects human behavior, which is a huge study in, in here, and uh, we tested, of course, students of the uh, Faculty of Sciences because we had them in there, and we found that people who were infected with toxoplasmosis had lower verbal intelligence, right. which was surprising. Right. Then, then we checked uh, our data and found out that people are more uh, um, easily get infected in villages. Right. So it was villages, it wasn't toxoplasmosis. Right. And uh, you don't know this beforehand, so we need some variable uh, sample, not necessarily the representative ones, but we need to look at the variables and which are actually well, important think, or not. That, that reminds me that there's also a strong case for like norms of reporting, right? So it's still true that papers that look at like yeah. white people from like the US or, or, or Europe have titles like, you know, whatever, like, death anxiety leads to religious belief or something like that. <laughs> Whereas like if you collect data from Mauritius, like you will always say death anxiety leads to religious belief in Mauritius. As if Europe and America is not a place, yeah. but like a universalizable kind of like default humans. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we, we definitely still have a strong default humans bias for and, and I think like that and that seems easy to change, right? Because then, then you don't need to just make everyone collect data from like everywhere representatively. Just like persuade people to report accurately that their data comes from a very small northwest eastern like northeastern college in America or something yeah. like that. Like and I think Editor, those of us in the room who are editors, and certainly those of us in the room, which is most of us who are peer reviewers, that's definitely something we should push push people to do. Like, look, in your titles, get it right. Tell us that you're your at least in your abstracts. Oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like anywhere in the paper, yeah. really. But, no, <laughs> but, but the title thing is a real thing. It's like, you know, it, it's still, it, it really still is the case that like outside of the US and, and, and Europe, we're still reporting country names in titles. But but I never, I basically never see it when it's American <laughs> data or British data or European data. My favorite yeah. anecdote about this was presenting the study I did in the Czech Republic and Slovakia with uh, Lubomir Singel um, at SPSP, which is a big social psychology conference. And someone in the question period asked me a question that was, it's really great that you're using a non-weird sample, but how does this generalize to the rest of the population? And I think every part of this question is like, right. like <laughs> what is happening? It's like, well, these, are, these are white people from Europe. <laughs> and, and, like, and like, 
why, yes, do, how does it generalize? How is that not true? Like, I don't, why yeah. is that the question for this study? That's like, for everybody. Like, <laughs> right, I don't actually know that. <laughs> All right, we, we basically want to know about the U.S. Tell us about the U.S. Yeah. <laughs> so big, oh, oh, something I was going to add with yeah. developmental. So, I mean, most people as psychologists have a problem with undergraduate students. Well, we have the problem that most people recruit, they're usually, um, like, professors. So they're kids of professors. Yeah. So we still get a very slim... I think slice of the population because these are well-educated mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. um, so we have, we also have that same problem. Um, but as far as like looking at demographics, it's also choosing which variables to look at. So more and more and more, we're seeing with developmental papers they can't be published unless you report kind of an overall kind of demographics. And so that is something that we're seeing more and more. Yeah. Um, so it's I think, but I think that's exciting that like reviewers are like, nope, we don't want to publish it unless you can kind of verify what the population is coming from. So um, so I think it's a great suggestion as editors and yeah. peer reviewers. I think we need to be pinpointing that so that there, it changes systemically, I think, how people look at studies. So yeah, mm. I think I think it is changing. I'm seeing it more and more in the work that I do. Cool. Alicia? Yes. Uh, I have impression, based on what just uh, you said, that uh, some people just think that uh, uh, representative samples are just uh, random samples. And I think th th these are just two separate things, because sometimes these terms are just uh, used interchangeably. But what we're thinking uh, and what we should do is probably Conrad uh, implied that we are thinking about, in sociology at, at least, about random samples, which is not quite the same as uh, representative samples. I because when we Sorry? I hope I didn't mean that. <laughs> yes, but sometimes this, these know. terms are just used like synonyms, but they are not, because sometimes people just uh, assume that when we take sample about 100 or 1,000 items or 100 or 1,000 people, it is uh, random, but it's not. set it's two different uh, paradigm, right? And just I want to make this remark, but because sometimes I think that people just mix these two terms and forget uh, that um, what we mean by the representative samples is that the samples are taken randomly, right, with a particular procedure and don't have to be super large. Like, for example, most of the samples for your society is like 2000, 2000 and for Pop, for, for example, for Poland, it's just 1,000, and, and the population is much, much higher. So, I don't need. I, I don't think we just just uh, should um, make our samples bigger and bigger, even in sociology. But probably we just uh, take the items uh, in a more smarter way. Yeah. But I mean, a, a sample size of 1,000 or 2,000 is bigger than most psychological studies. Um, Already. Yes, but uh, I think that what, what is the most important is the procedure, not the size. Of course, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. sure. And if yeah. you are looking for very strong effect, you don't need to, even 1,000 people, you need to, let's say, 200 and you of course. Problem. Yes. Yeah, you get like all kinds of model overfitting problems if you have like ten thousand people. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. sometimes it's not really a virtue. Um, I, so like I take the point that there's a difference between random and and, um, and representative samples. Uh, but like, like one of the lessons I like I think I'm learning from my friends in political science is that. Uh, the, the, the sampling methods that we used to call random are not in fact random. Yeah. Right? Exactly. Bias from the get-go. <laughs> exactly, and I think after COVID, this is almost impossible to get a ran truly random sample. Right. And not only because we are switching to the online uh, panels, yeah. but also because we have something like 30 or 40% 40, 40 response rate. Yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. absolutely contrary, you know. Uh, Self-selection problem. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And this yeah. is going to be much and much more uh, difficult to get a truly random sample. I don't think it's really possible. Yeah, right yeah now. But, but still, it's a scale. You're moving from very non-random uh, to purely random. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. Even if you got 75% of the randomness, it's better than uh, yeah. just go to the members of the clergy and ask them about the, yeah, the church. Yeah. I mean, like, you get to these debates a lot with like, oh, you know, like online samples are terrible, like MTurk is terrible. And, and like I, I generally don't know the answer to this question, right? But like, is an M3 sample worse than, you know, 
70 undergraduates from the northeast of America. Like, like I don't know. I just, I really, I just don't know. Um, it, it might be incrementally better, even though it's terrible. Slightly like, older. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you get, you get, Which you is get probably age. slightly better, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, you get more gender representation as well. Yeah, because, the, um, so it, this has been looked at, and it, it is pretty much like they're, on average, they're far more educated. Well, this is surprising to me. Like, M Turk workers are far more educated, and they have higher, like, SES. Like, it's just, who are these people? Like, the, 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 the general population. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so they're like, they're, they're not, they're not like, because I just don't understand who would work for like five cents an hour. Yeah, but it turns yeah. out it's like college graduates. People who don't, <laughs> people who don't need the money, I guess. <laughs> or like who need the money but only or for. Or have really people. boring office jobs and yeah, just yeah. like, yeah, I can make $4 today on m <laughs> Yeah, our problem, not only with the large samples, but also with small samples, is that we are, don't really know how much our data are biased by that, that old signs of, of all, all types of uh, self-selection and other problems. So, I mean, I mean the, the self-selection thing is, like, I don't know how you ever get around that because people need to have the right to refuse, like, ethically. To do a study, so like I don't. There's no There's no, you know, that, that, that you can't square that circle. Right? Like, like if, if you're gonna let people, so you know, I, I think there's a lot because I'm really interested in studying, you know, like kind of wacky spiritualist communities and, and these sorts of groups. And part of the problem is is that they they don't trust people who are working at universities and they won't answer your questions. So yeah. like the you know conspiracy theorists, all of these things, it's very difficult to yeah. to actually work with those communities. Um, and therefore, you just like even the people who will talk to you are probably not. Like, I mean, I think at that point, this is where we end up doing things like you have to do field work in like Western contexts to like actually get involved with those communities and be able to sample them properly, or else like you have to make people trust you, and that's a longer term process than just like doing online. The self selection problem must be like wrong, like really difficult, like intractable in development psychology, right? Because like, who are these people who have enough time to bring their kids to labs and that yeah. sort of thing, you know? Well, I, actually, with the self-selection problem, just very short story, right? Uh, we did a study of, um, on Facebook of people who were involved in the women's protests after abortion was made illegal in Poland, right? And we got that group and within an hour or two, we had like 800 responses. Boom, like that. And then we thought, well, we better get a comparison group, a Christian comparison group. So, you know, one of us started contacting various Christian groups and contacted like a dozen of them on Facebook. And most of them said, no, no way, we're not, we're not even putting the questionnaire on the group. And then finally, one group agreed. Wonderful, great progress. Uh, the uh, questionnaire was put on the uh, Christian group. And a month later, two responses. You got trolled. <laughs> yeah, I, used, I used the pronoun they in my ethics form accidentally. <laughs> just left it in there. I, I posted the study to an extreme right wing group of reactionary Catholics, honed in on that pronoun like a missile, and decided that I was in there to subvert them, to ridicule them. And I was some sort of like a non binary Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> So they had you pinned, right? You were not wrong. Right? Yeah. And then, then I got ten responses. <laughs> yeah. So if I may, just a follow, quick follow-up, um, then I have a question. Uh, I think we are missing uh, our econ friends in the room, perhaps. Maybe we could look at, uh, for inspiration, um, uh, to them, because uh, just one example I have uh, from my own experience working with um, with um, John Weigel, who who is an economist, and he was part of the CERT project that I guess most of the people here know about. Um, so you are collecting data in different field sites, and he was collecting data in um, DRC in Congo. And what they did is that they took a satellite uh, pictures of Kananga of the city. They divided the households in like the areas into pentagons. Mm -hmm. And then they randomly sampled households from each pentagon, and then they went to those randomly sampled households to ask questions. You know, so they actually like really took the randomization thing like, inherently into design how they are going to select participants randomly. But I, it's it's go ahead. I was going to say we tried to do this in Fiji and it failed. So not yeah. like satellite mm. images, but we went to different neighborhoods and mm. recruited different people at kind of and like. 
it was impossible. So lots of people agreed to do our study. We were very successful at getting agreement, and then none of them did yeah. it. <laughs> so like it was just you know, like, yeah. I just it, if you work in a culture where like agreement to do something and like when you show up or if you ever actually do that thing are just oh. completely detached, these things become. Because political, <laughs> political scientists basically do that, right? So they make the full mm. book and then they mm. randomly pick yeah. whatever, 50,000 yeah. people. But then the problem is that you, you reach out to 50,000 and then seven reply, right? And then you do it like 900 <laughs> times. But, but and by, that, by the 900th time, your sample is no longer random. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? you know? yeah. yeah, of course. I mean, you have to weight it, like the response rate and yeah, yeah, everything. Exactly. So, yeah, I agree. But it boils down, I think, and that's, that's actually my question, um, to the question of trade offs. Right, so yeah. of course I agree. I also want to use representative samples in my studies, but my studies are difficult to run. They are expensive, and they have to be run in a lab. So, um, do I want to get a, a you know like a random sample from the general population come into my university lab? Yes, I do want that. Do I have money and means to do it? No. Should I run the study? That's my dilemma. You know, so is it better to? Well, I, I think we can agree it's better to collect data and you know acknowledge you know the limitations, but then we are getting at you know like the weird people problem that I acknowledge there is a problem, but do not do anything about it. Um, so I mean it's just my dilemma that I don't know if there is so, obvious solution other than like get more money. So, but so most of the sample are representative based on some criteria like gender, mm. education, and so on. Are those variables important in your projects? Well, I assume not, but well, you know, no. then we are back at this. So, 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 yeah. my, my perverse, my perverse suggestion, right, is actually to collect more like homogeneous samples, mm -hmm. less diverse samples, mm -hmm. right? So that you only study white males from the Czech Republic or something like that, right? But then, and then you say so. Like, look, I have no idea whether I can generalize this to even white women in the Czech Republic, <laughs> let alone like, like brown people in Bolivia or whatever, like Chinese Malaysians like myself or something like that, right? And, and like, and, but at least that's being honest, right? Like, look, if, if, if we know that we have a representation problem, and we like are aggressive about how homogeneous our, our samples are, and like are very like honest about how homogeneous samples are. Like, I think that is better than pretending to collect a representative sample. I, I would go with like multi-method approaches are really a way to kind of try to get at this. So I think like you know you have a question in mind. There are probably simpler, kind of shittier ways to get at that question that you could do mm -hmm. with a larger sample mm -hmm. more yeah. easily. And maybe just doing both of those things, you have like, okay, well, this is looking at a large group of people in a way that's like, eh, not great. This is a really clean cut, you know, clear laboratory study, but the sample is kind of terrible. Do these converge yeah. <laughs> in any way? And I, I think like at some point, you know, these are really practical problems that we can't. I don't know how. There's just no. Way to solve this, right? Like, so, so, but you can try to do mm. things and yeah, you know, and be honest about mm. your kid. Yeah, uh, overly honest methods is probably one of my favorite websites. Yeah. <laughs> right. I wanted to submit something to that, but I, I decided it was not it was bad. So we, we did a when we did our, our um, I did a study in Fiji when I was working there in my PhD. And we were, we were collecting data with Hindus, and we were doing economic games as part of the CERC study, and then we did a follow-up study. And we ended up having to add a study to the protocol. So I do this the whole, I have a whole study on like conversion rates amongst, uh, amongst Christians that we added simply because they were mad at us for giving money to the Hindus, which just never occurred to me that it was like, all of a sudden we had these people who were like, why are, why are you giving us money? <laughs> oh, oh shit. <laughs> So, so yeah, we, we ended up running a, an entire study That's based fine. on like not starting like a massive in the village we were working like, in, like without us starting like an interracial war. <laughs> and, was, and like one of my research assistants lived there, and she was like, she was Christian, and she just it never even occurred to her. And then she was like, yeah, there's some very mad people in my village. <laughs> I'm like, okay, 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 we will we'll fix this. <laughs> so we did a we did a study looking at like conversion rates amongst different Christian groups. That's very funny. With money. <laughs> It's a cool study. <laughs> they should not tell them that the love of money is the root of all evil. <laughs> you say, no, but it is, it is like on, on Will's thing on population-based methods, so it's a random allocation task. And one of the things we did find is that um, the Christian converts cheated, but to be more fair, 
So, <laughs> so and it like not in, it's really hard to like look at that, but like you can't just because it's it's you're you're looking at like a binomial distribution, mm -hmm. you're looking at deviations, and this is one where the binomial distribution is just like. Like there's just way more people who are giving like a fair split than is, is is in any way possible, but it's really hard to statistically show that with the sample sizes we had. Because you need just absurdly large samples yeah. to show that type of deviation. But yeah, it, people were like the the the, the converts were much more, um, particularly when they were dealing with anyone who was not a Hindu. That like people who converted from Hinduism to Christianity were like overly fair with everyone except for the Hindus, which they blatantly cheated against. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Other questions? Okay, well, I don't see any hands going up, so there's something else that I wanted to ask. Um, what we've heard a number of times here, I only just said it a couple of minutes ago, talking about the need to use mixed methods, right? And I'm very deep, you know, deeply in favor of that. Um, but I'm thinking, you know, some people don't like doing that. They've got a methodology they're happy with. Um, it works for them, it gets them results, and they figure that others do other methodologies. How much of an issue do you think it is when you have researchers who say, look, I've got one methodology, I'm just going to focus on that, I'm not going to do anything else? I mean, as long as someone's doing something else, I think it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I don't know, like, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm easily bored of what I'm researching, so I tend to jump around on topics and methods a lot. But I think, like, I don't know, you can, as long as you're aware of the, like, limitations and of what you're doing, and there are people who are doing other things. I think the problem arises when people are like, I do AITs, and this is the only real way to measure the world. We are the yeah. accurate information about, and there are people out there that do this. <laughs> like, this is the accurate information about people's beliefs and, and attitudes, and nothing else matters, and I think, you can build your little empire, and then that's that's really problematic. But you just I've seen it one way. Like Deb Kellerman, she has you know a certain topic and a certain methodology that she's used. But I think around that, she's then tested a whole bunch of different samples, different age groups, different kind of demographic to kind of look at the same. Yeah. So she's using a certain type of methodology, but then within that, testing variation between lots of different things, and so. I think it depends on perhaps the person or the topic, because I think you can also use it in a different way. It may not be multi-methods, but at least it's testing the same kind of construct in a variety of different ways. So it's pinpointed, but I think... And if you email Deb Pellman and say, I'm really interested in this thing you're doing, but I want to do it with like adults in Vanuatu, she'll be like, that's great. Here's all my materials. Yeah. Here's everything you ever needed to... Yeah. Like, you know, it's just... It's just yeah, and I think that's... You know, that's what you want. You want people who are kind of open to. Awesome. And, yeah. Awesome. I once was talking to one of the terror management people at a conference. We were at a conference dinner, and I ended up sitting next to him. And someone else had questioned, like, you know, there's a lot of problems with replication of this, and his, his and like all there, you know, sets of labs that do these things, and like only certain groups of people seem to be able to get these consistent results. And his response was like, well, it's really more of an art. You really have to have the like nuanced way. And this is, you know, again, people boring. who really believe that like this is the one true way to do it. And yeah, you, you get that sort of thing where it's like, okay, that's bad. <laughs> if you, if you mm -hmm. are the only person who can get your results and you don't see anything wrong with that, then, that. then that's problematic. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and John and I have talked to each other about terror management many occasions. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions? Well, in that case, I have a statement, which is that we have a uh, a uh, reservation for 7 p.m. So that's about. 15 minutes away from here? No, 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 it's three minutes from here. Three minutes away from yeah, here? Yeah, it's very, very close, so let's say uh, 10 minutes before 7 o'clock, we can mm -hmm. get Wait, Are we all together? Or it's 12? It's a reservation for 12, yes? Uh, give or take, but yeah. Okay. And you said that we're very glad to hear that, that we're coming. Yes. 
So it sounds like if like there are more than 12 of us, this will not be... Sure, 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 sure. Okay. I'm sure we can fit. Okay. Oh, really? Okay. And also, also they promised us that for uh, vegan and vegetarian, they can think about some some dishes as well, but... Uh, we hopefully they can do more than think. For example, chicken or something like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of the first time I was in Poland when I asked for the vegetarian menu and they literally suggested fish and chicken. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's bad. Chicken probably is the same. There's several vegan restaurants. I have seen several vegan restaurants walking around here. Yeah, well, the, 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 there's a good vegan restaurant too. Okay. Um, what kind of cuisine is this? Sorry. What kind of cuisine is this? I would say Czech. Czech. But since you are in Czech, yeah, you should suffer the Czech cuisine. And what's the name of the place? Uh, Na Slamku. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 oh, th this reminds me of the time I was going to uh, St. Go Andrews <laughs> right, and I was going to stay in a and b there and I was talking on the phone to the lady who had the strongest Scottish accent I had ever heard and I said, okay, right, I have some extra questions but I can just email you, can you tell me what your email address is? And suddenly I found out that there are lots more letters in the English alphabet that I've ever known about. Like, what the hell are these? And I went, okay, yeah, I, okay, thanks, I'll find it on the net. <laughs> All right, thank you very much for today. Um, we start tomorrow.